All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our CU Prime Talk semester. So um, is this working? Nice. Perfect. Uh, so if you guys do not know what CU Prime is, we are a student group that was started in the physics department uh, that is devoted to increasing allyship, equity, inclusion, and diversity in the physics department and beyond. And so one of the ways that we do that is through this talk series where we introduce scientific research in a jargon-free way from the perspective of graduate students or other researchers at times as well. Um, so today we have Brooke Schuld, who is a graduate student who's going to tell us about her research detecting neutrinos or trying to. I guess we'll hear about that. Uh, we'll also get to hear about her um, life story, not complete life story, but at least some of it so that we can help to personalize research and see that science isn't just something that the old white men do. Um, so these talks are a bit different than your normal seminar talk in that we will also allow for times of discussion throughout. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt at any point and we're happy to field those questions. But otherwise, I think I'll let you take it away. Also, uh, if you're joining in person, then we have a QR code for you to sign in on. Uh, we have plenty of pizza and if we want more pizza, then let us know that you're here so we can keep track of the numbers. And if you're joining us online on, you online on YouTube, then welcome. If you have any questions, feel free to type those in the chat. All right, uh, without further ado, join me in welcoming Brooke. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, nice to meet you all. Yeah, so I do neutrino physics. Uh, I work specifically on Dune, which is the deep underground neutrino experiment. I work with Professor Alicia Marino, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about neutrinos and why they're so cool and why they're really hard to detect, but why they're called the ghost particle. Um, yeah, so first I'll give you kind of just like a quick roadmap of what I'm going to go through today. So I'll talk a little bit about how I got here, how I got started with neutrinos, and then I'll talk a little bit about the standard model of particle physics before focusing really in on neutrinos specifically. Uh, and then we'll go over some of the like theory, experiment behind it. Uh, and finally, we'll go into Dune, uh, what Dune is, what the experiment is, and what I do for it uh, personally. So uh, basically, how did I get here? What happened to you guys having to listen to me talk for 45 minutes now? So I grew up in Northern California. If any of you guys know where like Sacramento or Lake Tahoe is, kind of that region. Um, and I was always pretty interested in science. I loved uh, astronomy, genetics, uh, but I didn't really get super into physics uh, until a little bit later. So I took my first physics class in high school. Um, I actually, here's a picture of, uh, of, of my group. We built a boat for my physics class uh, for a competition, which we won, not to brag. Um, but when I went to college, I graduated high school in 2018 and I went to UC Davis and I actually went in undeclared. Uh, so I had did consider doing like science and STEM, but I'd also considered doing like law and political science and maybe becoming a lawyer. Um, but that first year, I ended up taking a my first college physics class taught by probably the best professor I've ever had in my entire life. He was amazing. Uh, the class was amazing. The TA was amazing. The lab, the students, everything. The stars just aligned for that class. Um, and it was at that point that I really began considering physics as a career, or at least for the next four years of my life. Uh, so at the end of my freshman year, I declared as a physics major, uh, and I joined in a bunch of activities, including something called Physics Club, uh, which I ended up becoming the vice president of for the last two years. I also ran something called the Picnic Day Show, uh, which if, for those of you who don't know, uh, we put on a show every, uh, every year. It's about 30 minutes, and it's like a parody, a physics parody of some sort of piece of media, a movie, a TV show. And so the year I did it, uh, we did Indiana Jewels and the Raiders of the Lost Fork. Uh, and it was really fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, and it's a great way to like blend uh, physics with your other interests. So like theater, writing, directing, stuff like that. Uh, and that's just a reminder to you all that there's more to physics than just, you know, doing e &M homework for four hours or reading the Feynman lectures or whatever you want to do in your spare time. Um, but how I got into physics, uh, like neutrino physics specifically, so during my first year, I applied to a number of internships. And the one that I got into was a high energy density physics internship, HEDP, uh, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And I was working in the Department of Weapons and Complex Integration, uh, studying nuclear detonation double pulse signatures. Uh, and I had an amazing summer. It was a great time. I love my mentor. Uh, and, and it was fantastic. I know there's a lot of emphasis on REUs. Uh, which are great as well, but I highly recommend looking into national lab programs as well because there are tons of opportunities and they can be a really great experience. 
Um, and so that I finished up my summer there, went back to school. Next summer rolls around and it's COVID. Um, so my advisor, my old mentor reached out to me and was like, hey, we're not taking on new students, but if you would like to come work for the summer, uh, or you work remotely over the summer, like that would be great. So obviously I did that. And at the end of the summer, he's like, do you want to work part-time remotely? And so I said, yes. Uh, and I was offered a staff position uh, at, well, at the lab uh, where I continued to work up until pretty much I came to Boulder. Uh, so fall of 2022. And there I was creating working uh, models for yield determinations, uh, working with like the DOD and for nuclear non-proliferation. Um, but as I was doing this, I knew that it wasn't really what I wanted to do for my entire life. I didn't want to do like very classical weapons-based nuclear physics for the rest of my life. Um, and so I began looking at uh, people in my department at UC Davis. And one of the people that uh, I ran into was my quantum mechanics professor, uh, Professor Robert Svoboda. And he mentioned that he was looking for an undergrad for the coming upcoming summer and the following school year, which would have been my senior year. So I went to talk to him uh, and I learned a little bit about his research, which was neutrino physics. And I had never really heard a lot about neutrinos. I didn't really know a whole lot about them. They weren't super taught uh, in my undergrad classes. And so I thought it was really interesting. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you will also think similar things. Um, but I was eventually put on a project for uh, WBLS development, which is water-based liquid scintillator. It's basically what they put inside the detectors that does the detecting. Um, and so once I did that uh, and uh, began working for this lab, that was something that I actually could see myself doing for the rest of my life. Uh, and so when I applied to grad school, I, I applied as a high energy experimentalist. Uh, and uh, when I came to Boulder, I talked to like the nuclear people and the CMS people. And I also talked to Alicia and Eric, uh, who's another professor in neutrino physics here at Boulder. Um, and after talking to them and some of their grad students, learning a little bit more about Dune and what I would be doing, I decided that uh, this would be a really great fit. And so I actually came out the summer before I started grad school and began working on Dune. Uh, and I, so I currently work on the Dune near detector. Um, there's a picture of me. I'm not at the near detector. I'm actually at the far detector. Uh, is that CERN? But you know what? You you guys, you get what you get. Um, yes. So now that we kind of have a little bit of background, and obviously I said I didn't know a whole lot about neutrinos when I was an undergrad, so I would like to know what you guys know, mostly so I can kind of scale the talk. Um, so what do you know? What makes them different from other particles? What do we care about neutrinos? Share your thoughts and your ideas. What have you heard about them? All right. Welcome back, everyone. All right. What do you guys know about neutrinos? Enlighten me, please. Anyone? Anyone? No, does, anyone, does no one know a single fact? They about probably neutrinos? exist. Good job. <laughs> Thank I you. I, all right. I'm going to call on someone randomly. Okay. You tell me what fact. Yes. <laughs> they're random. They're random? I said that's very random person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're almost not what they're Very good. Yes. What, what possibly could have given away the fact they have no charge? Anyone? I don't interact with the answer. No, I was going to, I mean, Damn. yeah, thank you. It's called a neutrino. It is neutral. Very good. All right, well, then I'm going to assume that you guys don't know much about neutrinos at all, which is fine. Uh, I prepared for that. So let's talk about some particle physics. So here's the standard model of particle physics. Um, when a lot of people think about particle physics, you know, they think of like, uh, CERN, they think of the, the particles at, uh, or the detectors at SLAC or the accelerators. And there's that's great. Uh, you know, we love those. We love slamming particles together. Uh, but there's more to physics than, than just that. And so what we're doing at these facilities, what we're doing at CERN, is we're probing what we call the standard model of particle physics, which is basically uh, the best theory that we have of the universe and how everything interacts and what's inside of it. Um, it's predicted the existence of numerous particles, most famously the Higgs, but it's responsible for explaining so much of what we observe, from atomic excitations to why particles have mass. Unfortunately, it's not perfect. Um, it's really bad at gravity. We have not been able to put gravity into the standard model yet. Uh, that's kind of its biggest flaw. But it's also really bad at neutrinos. For example, the standard model predicts that neutrinos should be massless. And as our lovely participant said earlier, they are not massless. Um, and so that's kind of why our experiments are so important, is because we don't have a very strong theoretical understanding of neutrinos. We have to probe with their physics with experiment. Uh, so now I'm going to go through just kind of some terminology, just so what I say later on makes a little more sense. Um, we're going to start first with our forces. So there are four fundamental forces, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong force, and the weak force. Now that I've said gravity, we're going to throw it away and never talk about it again. As I said, it's not in the standard model. Um, you're probably pretty familiar with electromagnetism. 
and it's what we call it's a mediator, which is the photon. The uh, by mediator, I just mean that's what makes the force do the forcing, basically. Uh, and then we have the strong force, which is mediated by the gluon. Uh, the strong force is responsible for holding together nuclei. Uh, and then we have the W and the Z boson, which are the mediators of the weak force. And as the name suggests, the weak force is the weakest of the forces, and it's responsible for things like radioactive decay. Uh, these are all what we call spin one bosons. That doesn't mean anything to you. That's fine. Doesn't matter. Um, but it does separate what we call our force particles from oh, this side over here, which are spin one half fermions. Uh, fermions are what make up matter, everything that we can see and we can touch. Uh, and it's separated into two categories. We have our quarks, uh, which make up protons and neutrons, and we have our leptons. You're probably most familiar with the electron, uh, but this is also where our neutrinos lie. Uh, and there's two main, there's a main difference, one main difference between quarks and leptons. And that is the fact that, the fact that quarks have a property called color. So you can think about color as kind of analogous to the electric charge. Um, so things that are charged, right, can interact electromagnetically. Things that have color can interact with the strong force. So quarks can interact with the strong force. Leptons cannot. Uh, for the sake of completeness, there's a Higgs. It's responsible for mass. We spin zero. Please don't ask me any more about it. Uh, <laughs> all right, so now that we know some of the properties that particles can have, what properties do neutrinos have? Uh, and to kind of answer this, we're going to actually hop back in time a little bit. So let's imagine you're a physicist from the 1920s. You know of three particles, the positively charged proton, the negatively charged electron, and the photon. Uh, we also know of a process, it's a new and amazing process, called radioactive decay. In radioactive decay, you have some nucleus, which we call alpha, which decays into a daughter nucleus, B, and some third particle, C. This third particle characterizes the type of radioactive decay. So there's alpha, beta, and gamma. In alpha decay, you produce an alpha particle, which is just a fancy name for a helium nucleus. For beta decay, you produce an electron. And for gamma decay, you produce a gamma ray, which is just a very high energy photon. Now, physicists noticed something interesting when they went to categorize and um, calculate this, the energy of that third particle. And so what we have here is a graph of an alpha energy, so an alpha particle, an alpha and decay. And what we see is a very distinct uh, and discrete energy bar. So what that means is that alpha particle had for one particular energy. Now we have two spikes here because they actually have two daughter particles. So it's a different B uh, up here. But they, each B corresponds to a finite energy for our alpha particle. And this was the same for gamma particle, right? We have a very discrete spectrum. Spectrum. Blah. But for beta particles, what we actually saw was this continuous spectrum, which meant the electron could take on numerous energies. And to see why this is kind of weird, let's look at some two-body kinematics, right? So we have a daughter nucleus, it's at rest. It has some, or sorry, we have a regular nucleus, it's at rest. Uh, it has some rest energy equals mc squared. It then decays to a daughter nucleus, which also has some rest energy equals a different n c squared, and we have our electron. Now, due to energy conservation, what we know is that the ener total energy here should be equal to the total energy of these two particles in the end. Now, since the energies of these two are just related to their masses, that should fix the energy of our electron. And it's actually given by this formula right here. At some point in physics, you'll probably do this calculation. But we didn't see that, remember? <laughs> yes. So why does B have the, uh, why does B have, why doesn't B have the velocity? Like, could it not be moving? Yes, so the uh, assumption here is that A and B are really, are much more massive uh, relative to the electron. Um, which is why we do get like a slight smearing. If you remember the alpha spectrum, you do get a little bit of a wit, but it's for the most part, almost incredibly discrete. Um, and, but again, we don't see that for beta. We saw a very, very large and continuous distribution. Um, and this puzzled physicists for many, many years. And the answer finally came to us uh, uh, from Austrian physicist Wolfgang Pauli, who on December 4th, 1930, wrote a letter to the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. He titled it, Dear Radioactive Ladies and Gentlemen, uh, from which he goes on to uh, propose the existence of a neutral spin one-half particle that exists in the nucleus, which he called the neutron. Uh, and this was not a super popular theory, um, but it did solve the problem, right? Because now, instead of one particle that had to have a definite energy, we have two particles that could share that energy. So you could give one to the electron and, you know, four to the neutrino, or two to the electron and three to the neutrino, or some, some continuous spectrum, right? And that's what would give us the continuous spectrum that we saw in beta decay. 
Um, and this theory finally became popular in 1934 when Fermi wrote his breakthrough paper on beta decay. Uh, in between these two events, what we call the neutron was actually uh, discovered and kind of co-opted that name. So Fermi renamed it the neutrino, which it just means the little neutral one. Um, yeah, so it's been about 100 years since we first proposed that neutrinos existed and about 65 since we first detected them. Uh, and we know a whole lot more about them now. Um, but th th there are still a fair number of mysteries. But we do know that Pauli was correct. It is, in fact, a neutral spin one half lepton. Uh, we know that it only interacts via the weak force, right? Because it's neutral, so there's no electromagnetic force, and it's a lepton, so no strong force either. And that, again, that only leaves the weak force, which means it does not like to interact with matter very often at all. Uh, for example, there are about 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 neutrinos uh, will pass through your body every second. But there's still only about a 25% chance that one will interact with you in your lifetime. So assuming you live to be about 80 years old, that's 2.5 times 10 to the 22 neutrinos, which means about one in every 10 to the 23 will actually interact with a person. Uh, so that's very, very rare, right? It doesn't happen very often. Uh, but obviously we do detect them or else I would not have a job. Um, and so, you know, we've discovered a few more fun facts about them. Uh, we know there are three flavors. So the electron, the muon, and the tau neutrino, uh, named after the electron, the muon, and the tau of the charged electrons. Really creative, aren't we? Uh, we know that their flavor states and their mass states are not the same. So what that means is each flavor does not have one mass. Uh, and that's how we get something called neutrino oscillations. Don't worry, I'll get to that uh, a bit more in a bit. Uh, we also know that those masses, though, are very, very light. There are a few magnitudes, a uh, order, few orders of magnitude smaller than the next lightest particle. So you see over here, all of our like quarks and everything are in the MeV, GeV range, and neutrinos are way down here, six magnitudes smaller. Um, you'll also notice the giant error bars on this graph. That's because we don't really know what the masses are. Uh, we don't even know which one's actually the heaviest. Uh, fun fact. Um, yeah, so let's kind of recap where we are in history. So 1930, Polly proposes the, that neutrons exist. 1934, we get the paper. Now we have the neutrino. 22 years later, we get our first detection. Uh, and you guys can kind of see why it took so long, right? Uh, neutrinos don't like to interact very much. So what this experiment did, it's called Project Poltergeist, uh, hence the name of this talk, um, was they wanted to maximize the probability that they would actually get an interaction. And to do that, they were trying to increase what we call the interaction rate, which is basically the number of interactions you get per second, um, or you know, per whatever time interval you want. Uh, and so you can think about this classically, you can think about what we do in other experiments, but I want you guys to try to think about how we might try to increase interaction rate. What factors are going to go into that interaction rate? Discuss. All right. Does anyone have any ideas? What what factors do you think would go into a neutrino detection or any detection? Uh, yes, in the back. Uh, large amount of area. So we're going to need like, like, so yeah. like area. So we need a large area. So we need large detector. Very good. Anyone else? Yeah. 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 Um, okay. That that actually that is a strategy. It's not really used for like in interaction rates, but that definitely is a strategy. You are correct. Um, all right. So let's go through it. What is an interaction rate? The interaction rate is a product of three variables: the flux, the number of targets, which someone said earlier, and the cross section. So the flux is just the number of neutrinos that you have. Right? You can imagine spraying water out this window. How many neutrinos or how much water is flying through the open window? We want to maximize the number of neutrinos that are coming through our detector. Um, and so what Project Poltergeist did was they stuck their detector by a nuclear reactor, which happens to produce a bunch of neutrinos. Uh, so they had a flux of about 5 times 10 to the 13 per second per centimeter squared. Uh, so they had a much larger flux than just like the ambient neutrinos flying through the space. Uh, you can also increase your number of targets, right? We want a big detector. That's what part of the culture guys did. They had two giant liquid water targets. So two giant tanks of water. They're using protons basically for their interaction. Um, you can also have a denser material, right? So water has more targets per volume than steam. Uh, you can also have bigger targets, right? Bigger nuclei are easier to hit than smaller nuclei because it's a bigger target, uh, which kind of leads us into the third uh, part, which is the cross section. The cross-section is kind of just like a measurement of the probability of a type of interaction actually occurring. 
And so it has units of centimeters squared area. Uh, and you can kind of think of it like throwing darts at a dartboard, right? So you have that center in the dartboard that's worth 50 points. Uh, and if you're playing darts, it's pretty hard to hit that. That's why it's worth 50 points. But if you make that center hole bigger, right, it suddenly becomes much easier. And so that's how you can kind of think about it in terms of area, is by increasing your cross section, you're increasing the probability that uh, you have a specific type of interaction to occur. Uh, and how we can maximize our cross section is things that are more energetic can interact in a variety of different ways. So there's more chance of an interaction there. Uh, so for reference, Project Poltergeist, their cross section was six times 10 to the negative 44 centimeters squared. Uh, just to contrast that with normal like nuclear interactions, like proton-proton scattering, that's on the order of about 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared. So this is 20 orders of magnitude smaller uh, than nuclear interactions. And so you're probably at this point thinking, well, how do we actually detect a neutrino, right? We can't see them, they're neutral. Like how do we even know one interacted? Uh, and that's a great question. Luckily for us, we don't actually need to see the neutrino to know that interact to know that it interacted. So you can imagine someone throwing a tennis ball at your face, right? If it hits you in the face, you probably didn't see it coming. Um, but you have an interaction. You have now detected this tennis ball on your face, on your forehead. Um, and so you know, since it hit you in the forehead, uh, it probably didn't come from behind you, right? Uh, you know about how hard it hit you because you felt it, and you can see where it scattered off. So based off of this information, you can kind of put together where that tennis ball might have come from or who threw it. And this is exactly what we do in particle physics. It's called reconstruction. We reconstruct the events based off of things that we actually can detect in our detectors. So now let's consider a, in this case, an electron antineutrino scattering off of a proton here. So the antineutrino is the ball, the proton is your face. Um, and so from our detector, or from our perspective in our detector, what we see is an outcoming neutron and a positron over here. And these are things that we actually can measure in our detector and we can see. And so we can kind of put together the probability that this interaction was in fact a neutrino interaction. And for the most part, you know, we can pretty much say with certainty, like, yep, this was or was not a neutrino interaction. Uh, and that brings us to the next point, uh, which is we actually have to detect these outgoing particles. And so there are a few different detector types that we uh, utilize to do this. The first we'll talk about is the scintillator detector. So this was the one that was used by Project Poltergeist. Basically, if you remember from the previous slide, we had that neutron and that positron come off. That's what we call ionizing radiation. Uh, these particles are going to uh, exit the tank of water and go into the surrounding, what we call liquid scintillator uh, that surrounded the tank. When these particles enter the scintillator, they uh, excite electrons, which then de-excite and produce visible light. So that's what we see right here. This is a picture from my undergrad lab. Uh, and this is the liquid scintillator right here. So it's glowing because what's happening is it's de-exciting and producing visible photons. Those visible photons are then picked up by what we call a PMT, which is a photomultiplier two, which converts the energy of the uh, gamma ray into, or sorry, not the gamma ray, the uh, photon into an electrical signal, which we can then read out. So what physicists were looking for was they were looking for this signature right here. So we have the positron come out, it was, it's antimatter. It immediately annihilates with the nearest electron it can find and produces two gamma rays. The neutron undergoes what we call neutron capture uh, and produces a third photon. So what physicists were looking for was they were looking for a large first signal, a first pulse, uh, with a second smaller pulse a little bit later. So that's that's what they were looking for in uh, for Project Poltergeist. Uh, the next type of detector, which is really, really common in neutrino physics, is the Cherenkov detector. Uh, so when you have a particle enter a medium faster than the speed of light in that medium, you get what's called Cherenkov radiation. And Cherenkov radiation, uh, you can think of it kind of like a sonic boom, but for light. It's emitted in a very cone-like pattern. So what we have here, this is from uh, the TDK experiment in Japan. And these are all PMTs all inside of our detector. And you can kind of see, you can kind of imagine extracting out uh, into this cone-like shape, and you can see where the uh, photons actually made contact with the PMTs. Uh, the third type of detector is a charged particle tracker, which uses an electric field to drift charged particles. Uh, so obviously this requires on the particles having charge, which is why it doesn't work on neutrinos, um, but it's really great for things like timing. Uh, so say you have two interactions that occur in your de detector at the same time. This is really great for figuring out which particles went to which interaction. Uh, the final type that I'll talk about really quickly is a calorimeter. This basically measures energy deposits. So if you have something coming into your detector, it's going to deposit energy as it goes in. These are usually filled with high density things like lead. Um, and you can add up the energy that was actually deposited. If your particle stopped, 
you know it's how much energy it deposited, therefore you know how much energy it had when it originally entered your detector. And this is used for things like particle identification, right? Different types of particles behave differently in materials. And so we're gonna see um, the energy deposits behaving differently. So we can distinguish between things like protons and electrons. Yeah, so uh, this uh, after this discovery of the neutrino, uh, people kind of flocked to this field. It was a very new time for physics, right? And so in 1962, we had the discovery of the muon neutrino which showed that neutrinos have uh, generations the same way that the charged leptons do, right? Um, and in order to prove our model of the sun, uh, we set out to measure the flux of solar neutrinos. Uh, and then we ran into a huge problem. So astrophysicists had developed a, a model of our sun that relied on the fusion of helium, uh, so, uh, sorry, hydrogen into helium with the production of two neutrinos. Now, we knew that those neutrinos were just going to travel through space, and we could detect them here on Earth. So we set up a giant detector in an underground mine in South Dakota. It's filled with 100,000 gallons of perchloroethylene, which basically is just a cleaning solution. It meant they're just using chlorine atoms as their target. Um, and the theoretical values suggested that we should get an interaction rate of about five to nine and a half, what we call SNU. It's a solar neutrino unit. It basically just converts our interaction rate, so we're not talking about like 10 to the negative 64s. Um, but the problem was we only detected about a third of that. And that meant there was something wrong with our model, either our model of the sun or our model of neutrinos. And a lot of other experiments have been done to show that our model of the sun was most likely correct. So that meant there was something wrong with our neutrino model. Uh, and so we set up more experiments and they all kind of showed the same thing, that we're getting about one third of the flux that we expected. And there's a solution to this. I have kind of hinted at it. Does anyone have a solution as to what, what might solve this problem? Anyone have a guess? Anyone? No. All right, fair enough. I just have a quick question. Yeah. I'm looking at that graph. It looks like there are quite a few data points in the expected region. Yes, there are. I mean, it's a very high variability. Um, but yeah. this was, I mean, you can look at how long they did this for. Like, this was oh, okay. years, even years and of the age. average yeah. was within the blue part. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, like, there are a, quite, there are a few, but for the most part, like, they, they had a pretty high certainty. I think, you know, they had like their five sigma value that they wanted. Yeah. All right. No idea about the solution? Nothing? Yeah. Yeah, it's very good, neutrino oscillations. All right, so neutrinos from the sun are electron neutrinos, right? And what Holmstein was detecting was electron neutrinos. But what if those electron neutrinos weren't electron neutrinos by the time they made it to Earth? So let's imagine you, you're a neutrino, you are produced in the sun as an electron neutrino. Uh, you travel all the way to our detector on Earth, right? Uh, and we're gonna make a measurement. Now, the water. Um, you, can, you can see the probability that we detect this neutrino as an electron neutrino is no longer one. There's a small probability that what we detect is now a muon or a tau neutrino. And so that's why we got less, uh, that's why we got um, about uh, only a third of the values, because some of those electron neutrinos were not being seen as electron neutrinos. They were being seen as muon and tau, which were not detected in the detector. And this was actually proposed um, by a theoretical physicist in 1957, but it wasn't super popular and we didn't have a very strong theory for it. And a lot of, or we, had a, we didn't have a very strong uh, experimental evidence. Um, and in fact, it actually, uh-oh, my clicker isn't working. Okay, that, oh, there it goes. Um, it took until 2002 to actually confirm that neutrinos do oscillate, specifically solar neutrinos. Uh, this was the uh, object of a Nobel Prize when we actually finally did it. So let's let's dive into neutrino oscillations a little bit more. Uh, but let's start simple. Let's start with ice cream. So instead of neutrinos, we're going to talk about Neapolitan ice cream. So let's imagine you have a giant tub of ice cream, like giant, right? Like a trough. Uh, you take your spoon, you come over, you take your spoon. You dip it into the corner and you pull it out, right? You have chocolate ice cream. Great, fantastic. Who, who doesn't love chocolate ice cream? Uh, you now put your tub into a giant container and put a lid on it. So you can't see what the ice cream looks like in that tub. And let's say you've forgotten what it looks like for the sake of the thought experiment. Now you take your spoon and you move it over in your tub. Now you see why we end up with a big enough tub. 
Um, and you go to dip your spoon in. You're now making a measurement. You don't know what flavor you're gonna get, uh, but let's find out. You dip it in, you pull it out, it's strawberry. But it's the same tub of ice cream, right? The, uh, you know, the tub didn't actually change. It's just a combination of all the different flavors. And depending on where you are in your tub, you have a different probability of getting each flavor. So you can see over here, right? We have, there's a large amount of strawberry, uh, ice cream, and a little bit of chocolate and a little bit of vanilla. But if you move over slightly, suddenly there's a lot more vanilla and only a little bit of strawberry and chocolate. And so what that means is you have a different probability of getting each flavor depending on where you are in the tub. So if theoretically, if we knew how that ice cream was packed into the tub, we could kind of figure out where we would find the most chocolate, the most vanilla, the most strawberry. And that's kind of what applies to neutrinos. If we know how neutrinos propagate, how they oscillate in time, we can figure out where we're most likely to detect a neutrino, a muon, or a tau. Or an electron, a muon, or a tau neutrino. Sorry. Um, and so that brings us to a very interesting phenomenon in neutrino physics. And that's the fact that our mass and our flavor states are not one-to-one. -one. So there are two different ways of classifying neutrinos. We can classify them by their flavor, so electron, muon, or tau, or by their mass, one, two, or three. Um, the problem is those flavors do not have a definitive mass. I, if you take two electron neutrinos, they might not have the same mass, uh, which is pretty unique, because if you think of like two protons, right, they have the same mass. Uh, but that's not how it works for neutrinos. Uh, and so what we can do is we can write our flavor as a linear combination of the mass states. So these A, B, and C kind of tell us like, what proportion or what percentage of this neutrino is uh, has mass one, two, and three. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to propagate this through time. So when we do time evolution, what actually happens is uh, neutrinos propagate in their mass state. So oh, we get these time-dependent coefficients, A, B, and C. And one of the things that you really have to understand when it comes to neutrino physics is the neutrino isn't oscillating through the flavors. It's not an electron neutrino that becomes a tau, that becomes a mu, that goes back to an electron, right? What's happening is the probability of detecting it as one of those flavors is changing. And that's related to these coefficients, these A, B, and C. Um, and so what we can do instead, uh, we can also rewrite our mass state as a combination of the three flavor states. And so this is the experimental evidence that we have so far. These are what the current values tell us, these uh, A prime, B prime, and C prime are. Um, so we notice there are actually two graphs over here. One of them goes M1, M2, and M3. One of them goes M3, M1, and M2. Um, this is called the normal and inverse mass hierarchy, because like I said, we don't know which one is heavier. And so there are two possibilities. Um, but these colors correspond, so if we look at the M1, this one is mostly made of electron neutrinos uh, with a little bit of mu and a little bit of tau. So I'm gonna flash an equation up on the screen. Don't get scared, please. I'll uh, tell you what the most important parts so I'm kind of walk through it together. So this is the probability that you will measure, we're, we're gonna consider two flavors, right, for now. But this is the probability that you measure an L prime neutrino, given that you initially started as an L neutrino. Uh, and in this equation, there are really four variables that we can consider. There are two unknowns and two knowns. Our two knowns are the probability, right? We can measure this in our detector. We know how many interactions that we got. Uh, and we also have this L over E value. Uh, the reason we do, this is just the length divided by the energy of the neutrino. So the length is like how far it oscillated. Um, and the reason we scale it that way is so that we can compare for different experiments. So different uh, experiments have different uh, oscillation lengths and, you know, they have different energies. And we want to compare our results so that we can, you know, do more physics, have more data. Um, with those values, what we want to extract are our mixing angle theta and our mass squared difference delta m squared. Let's start first with the mixing angle. It is not an angle. It is actually a constant. It's a very unfortunate name, but it is not an angle. It is just, it's just a value and it's the same, if in this model, it's the same for all neutrinos in a vacuum. So this right here is just a constant and it's gonna set our amplitude with this graph over here, right? So it's gonna tell us what our maximum probability of a specific flavor is going to be. Uh, the other variable is the delta M squared. So this is the mass difference of squared. Uh, and it's the difference between M1 squared and M2, between our two masses. Uh, and so you'll notice this is why we have that mass hierarchy problem because we're not actually measuring the absolute masses, we're only measuring the mass differences. Uh, and this is gonna actually set the period of our oscillation. 
So if you have like the two troughs right here, those red ones, if you increase or decrease your delta m squared, you're going to move your uh, uh, your your period in or out. So you're going to extend or shrink the length between uh, troughs and peaks. So um, when we do an experiment, we want to extract whatever parameters we have, right? So for the three neutrino oscillation case, we have uh, three uh, thetas, three mixing angles, and we have three mass squared differences. And we want to extract those parameters. So when we're designing an experiment, we have to come up with ways to kind of probe at those and, and uh, make models to fit them. So what parameters can we vary in an experiment? What can't we vary? Uh, what, what is the best way to go about trying to extract these parameters? Okay. Uh, back over here. All right. What are what are we varying? You're designing an experiment. What do you want to change? Anyone? Yes. The length, that it's the length, the oscillation length. Very good. Anyone else? Yes. The media. The media. Great. Ah, oh, I love that. All right. Very good. So here are some of the experimental parameters. As was said, how long do we want to let them oscillate? L. We can change that. The type of detector we have, right? We home state was only sensitive to electron neutrinos. Uh, you can make detectors that are only sensitive to antineutrinos or muon neutrinos. You can also change what type of flavor you're starting with, what type of neutrino, right? So we can make a beam of muon neutrinos. We can make a beam of electron neutrinos. Um, and the traveling medium, very, which is very good. I actually was not expecting anyone to get that. Um, but when we're doing things on Earth, well, I'll get to you in one second. When we're doing things on Earth, we you know, usually travel them through rock, through the Earth. Um, but for things like solar neutrinos, right, they have to pass through the sun, uh, which is very hot and very dense. So those interactions actually do change the physics. And that is something we have to consider. Uh, yes. So why does it matter what flavor of neutrino you start with if they're oscillating in the first place? Well, because we want to measure how they oscillate. And depending on where you start with, you're going to get, you know, you can extract different parameters. Sure, I know, but like, maybe just like, Wait a fraction of a second, for example, or like make it a fraction of a we, we want the purest beam possible when we start. We want to know pretty much exactly what our beam okay. looks like. So if okay. we're starting with one particular flavor, That's it's very easy to measure like what it changes into. Um yeah. So during the experiment, we can change our neutrino energy, right? How energetic our neutrinos are, and we can change our flux rate, how many neutrinos we're actually sending to our car detector. Uh so these are a bunch of the experiments. They're just the logos. I thought they were cool. Um, and so that brings us to our last part of the topic, which is Dune. Uh, yes. So Dune is a long baseline experiment. Uh, it began construction in 2017 in South Dakota. Here is a picture of the excavated cave. Uh, for reference, those are bulldozers. Um, this is the fire detector. If you remember from the beginning, I had a picture of myself right by that. Uh, that's a better picture, more high quality. Um, but yeah, so Dune sends a beam of muon neutrinos starting from Chicago, uh, at Fermilab, and it sends it 800 uh, miles to an underground mine, uh, ironically the same mine from the Homestick experiment, um, to the far detector in South Dakota. Uh, so there are kind of two main parts to the experiment. There's a far detector and there's a near detector. Both of these are made of liquid argon TPCs, time projection chambers. Um, the far detector has four modules of cryogenically cooled liquid argon totaling about 70 kilotons. They are state-of-the-art detectors, some of the highest timing and spatial resolutions of any detector out there. The near detector, which is located about 600 meters from the actual source of the neutrinos at Fermilab, also liquid argon, much smaller. Um, we also have a couple of other detectors like sand uh, and the Minerva planes, which don't worry about the names, just different types of detectors. So the primary physics goals of Dune are to measure the neutrino oscillation parameters, those mixing angles and those delta M squares. We also want to finally, once and for all, figure out the neutrino mass hierarchy, uh, put an end to the debate. So um, obviously, this is a very huge experiment, uh, billions of dollars. And so we have a bunch of people working on this. We currently have about 1,400 active members of different activity levels. So for some people like me, this is their um, main experiment. But for some people, they only work on it like 25% of the time. At our last collaboration meeting, we had about 400 people that actually showed up in person. Uh, here's a picture of all of us at Fermi Lab. There is me, there's my postdoc, uh, there's my advisor. And obviously not everyone is working on everything at the same time, right? That would be huge and a giant waste of everyone else's time. So what we do is we break into what we call working groups. Um, and so you can kind of pick and choose what you want to work on. So on the near detector side, you can work on the uh, liquid argon modules, you can work on calibration, simulation, reconstruction, production, uh, similar things for the far detector. 
Um, you can work on the computing side, so like data transfer, um, management, what we call like file structures. Uh, so you can work on electronics, uh, hardware, software, uh, data management. Uh, there's so many options on what you can work on. So now I have one more question for you all. Uh, and it's, why do we have a near and a far detector? Why don't we just have a far detector, right? Why do we care what happens immediately after we inject our nutrients? It's the last question, I swear. Okay. All right, anyone have any ideas? Why do we have a near detector? I kind of, someone asked me a very leading question earlier. I know you need to know, like, the trade of the quality of that. Mm -hmm. But I'm also wondering if there's, like, are there two different frequencies of oscillations that you're trying to detect with? Uh, or the one higher frequency, the lower frequency? Um, okay, that's an interesting thought. Um, we could do that, except it's a little too close to our detector for us to be able to, especially by how little we understand neutrinos, we do not have the resolution for that. Um, but that's why we do have detectors of different lengths, right? So we have, you know, Dune will be the 800 miles, but there are other ones that are much smaller. Um, so like T decay, for example. Um, but yeah, but basically the biggest reason is we want to minimize our uncertainty at our bar detector, right? So we can say, all right, we had 50 interactions at our bar detector. Great, 50 out of how many? What did we start with? Um, and so we want to measure the unoscillated neutrino interaction rate so that we can compare that to the oscillated interaction rate at the far detector. Um, that's the main reason. But there are also some other reasons too. One of these is we want to understand argon cross sections, right? We want to make sure that uh, how we're actually doing our models are correct. And the near detector has a much larger flux than the far detector. So that means we get more statistics, which means we can improve our models. We also want to monitor the beam line, right? So if we, for some reason, see a sudden dip in energy at our near detector, we know we don't want to use the data from our far detector during that point. Um, and so what we can we can monitor beam quality this way and make sure that our beam is, you know, the correct energy, not the correct flux, and that we know all of the characteristics about it. And the final thing, which is one of the things that makes Dune really unique, is that we actually have a movable detector. So you can see here the beam is coming in this way, right, going through these. Uh, and this detector here, uh, MBLAR, actually moves along this axis. And what this does is electrons have a very um, peaked energy spectrum, which means if you move slightly off axis of the beam, you get a very narrow range of energies. And so what we can do with this is we can help decouple uh, the different parameters. So we're, we're varying a bunch of things, right? Um, and we want to know how those things are impacting our oscillation probabilities. Uh, and that requires us to kind of do some, some decoupling and some fancy math. And one of the ways we can do that is by having a movable near detector. So what do I do on Dune? Here's my work. So I work on two main things. Uh, I work on the two by two demonstrator prototype, which is basically like the near detector uh, part one. Uh, it's like the, 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 the near detector we make before we spend all of the money to make the real near detector. Uh, and I work on the calibration team. So here we have the cryostat and our four CPCs, which go in here, uh, which are right here. Uh, and then we have what are called the Minerva planes, uh, the Minerva modules, which are the PMTs that we stole from another experiment called Minerva. Um, and if you recall what a PMT is, the photomultiplier tube, it converts the photon energy into a, an electrical signal. And what I do is I calibrate that. So I want to know what energy photon corresponds to what type of signal. So we're looking at a detector response. Uh, so that's what I do. And I work on the production workflow. So basically, like, we get data. We have to analyze it. Uh, and then we can, you know, get results out of that. And so that's that's production. I also work on what's called the NDLR field cage, so liquid argon near detector. Um, and so those TPCs, right, we want to make really big ones. Uh, but before we make the really big ones, we want to make a small one to make sure it works so we don't waste billions of dollars on something that doesn't work. Um, and so what I do for it is I do electric field cage simulations. So we want the most uniform electric field that we can get. Um, we want to know what parameters we can change and what parameters that, if we change, is going to give us the most uniform field. And so it's kind of hard to see on the color here, but what we're doing is we're looking to minimize what we call edge effects uh, and maximize what we call our active volume, which is basically the volume in which the, uni the electric field is un uniform enough that we can actually get results out of it. So we want to minimize edge effects down here uh, and along the edges, and we want to make sure that uh, the parameters that we're changing, so things like strip width, uh, are maximized. Uh oh. It's fine. It's fine. We're almost done. Um, so basically, we want a uniform electric field. And I do simulations so that you know we don't have to spend a bunch of time and money doing something that's only going to make the electric field worse. 
All right, so one of the very cool things about Dune is that it's an international collaboration. Um, and so we have people that we work with from all over the world. Um, all of these orange things on the map are places that have an institution that is on Dune. And all of these marked places are, uh, pl um, like marked spots are places that people in my lab uh, in my group have actually been to in the last year only. Um, me personally, I've been to, just since January, I've been to CERN and I've been to Slack uh, and I'll be going to Fermilab again in May. Um, so the purple are kind of places that we go for like collaboration meetings where we talk about results, other people on Dune. And then the blue is where we go to do like actual work, um, you know, we're actually physical hands-on work, working on the detector. This is not an extensive list. This is just everything I can come up with in like five minutes. Um, so we travel a lot. It's kind of cool. But obviously, you know, I'm not traveling every day of my life. Um, and so I kind of took a couple days out of my last week to show you guys what I do every day. Um, I'm currently studying for what's called comps two. Uh, so it's basically this giant exam that I have to take um, before I can really start working on my thesis. So uh, I spent the first three hours of my Wednesday uh, doing that. I then went on to work on some game calibration stuff, mostly because I had a meeting with my advisor and I wanted to show things. Uh, I then worked on particle homework because it's due on Thursday. Um, I then had another meeting. Uh, this was for the electric field stuff. I then continued working on particle homework. Um, and then I did some more comps to studying, mostly because I was just waiting for trivia to start. I go to backcountry uh, trivia every Wednesday. It's a lot of fun. Highly recommend. Uh, Thursday, we had a consortium meeting. So June just elected a new spokesperson. Uh, it's like, you know, a figurehead. So we had a meeting about that. Um, I did the rest of my particle homework before going to my particle class, which is taught by my advisor. Hence why I needed to do really well on the particle homework. Um, I then went to an M by two meeting. That's just the Minerva meetings. Uh, and then I did my, I'm in the writing class because part of comps is writing a paper. So I took the writing class to write my paper. Uh, so then I just did various forms of writing for a very significant amount of time. Um, worked on my CU Prime talk and did some more comps to do studying because I felt like I hadn't done enough and, and stress. So I added all of that together just to kind of give you a sense of how much I spend on each activity. And I was actually pretty surprised at the results myself that I spent, it's about 30, you know, it's about one third for each thing. Yeah. So you had a lot of meetings, but where is your meeting to count, uh, like coordinate all your meetings? <laughs> <laughs> that is my brain at 5 a.m. Yes. Where's your first time? We're getting there. Yeah. All right. All right. This is how I spend my time. I don't spend all of my time on physics. Here we go. Uh, here's us to backcountry. We've done run, hiking, I go camping. I do things. Um, if you'll know, you'll notice some familiar faces in this photo. They're here to mock me. Uh, uh, yeah. Here's the recording I did on the standard model. Uh, not everything has to be related to physics, but that is. Um, anyways, yes, that's neutrinos. Do neutrino physics, they're cool and exciting, and I highly recommend. Thank you. Uh, so we have a few minutes for questions. In the meantime, uh, we do have a feedback form if you'd like to let us know how we're doing on these talks or specifically how Brooke was doing, then feel free to scan this code or go to this link. Uh, it doesn't have to be specific about Brooke. I think she did a great job. But we're always looking to, to make this talk series better to see what best serves the community. Um, and if you want to help out with future talks or even give a talk yourself, then feel free to talk to me or there are a few other people in the audience who also uh, help out with the talks. Um, but yeah, I will let you direct the questions if we have any. So yeah, what questions do we have? So the, when the neutrinos are oscillating and they're like oscillating between the layers, mm -hmm. the mass is oscillating, but is that the only like characteristics that it's showing, or are there actual like different interactions between each It's actually slightly backwards, and that's one of the things that's really tricky to understand about So we have the energy states, the mass states, and we have their um, flavor states. What we detect is their flavor states. But actually, I don't know if you've taken quantum mechanics. You're in it right now. So you know, uh, like well, what a wave function is, right? Even some things are, you know, stationary states and eigenvalues are, right? So the masses are actually uh, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors that evolve in time, or that don't evolve in time. So those are our stationary states. So when we're looking at those A, B, and C coefficients, uh, we're applying the time evolution to the coefficient and not to the mass states themselves. So the only thing that's changing is the relative fraction of M1, M2, and M3. 
Yeah, and so yes, exactly. The probability of measuring it in a particular flavor is changing. It's not actually like oscillating through the different flavors. It's just the probability that we'll detect it in one of those flavors is changing. So you're saying if I were to create a pure mass one state, that would stay in mass one state? It would stay, yes. If, yeah, if you created a pure mass one state, it would stay in mass one as it oscillated. Okay. But we would not detect it as mass one. We would detect it as one of the three layers. Yes. So if you measure the fields in the new sector, right? Because there are like this mixed state between different masses, right? But you measure it, sorry, these are different flavors they get mixed up. But if you measure it, do you not collapse? Yes, you are. Yeah, you see your yeah, the last not an experiment at all. No, because we have enough neutrinos. We're not most of the neutrinos are gonna pass through the neutrinos. What we're doing is we're taking a small sample of those so that we can characterize the heat. So basically we look at like of the interactions that we got, how many of those had this energy, how many of them um, were actually uh, electron neutrinos. Um and so the ones that are detected in the near detector don't make it to the part detector. Yes. So this is got back in time, not your work, sorry. Okay. But I was just wondering if in the um like solar neutrino detection experiments, mm -hmm. if there was any like over time or over seasonal change. Because aren't you essentially changing your path length as the Earth sun distance moves? Yes, like, you are. You are. You are changing your distance out. Um and there's also a slight variability in the energy of the neutrino that we produce. Um our detectors are not sensitive enough. Uh, to really distinguish that. We don't have a strong enough understanding. Theoretically, um, there would be a difference, but we are not really able to detect it at that scale. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Um, does the source itself ever really oscillate in time or whatever, or is it just kind of like our distance to it? What do you mean? Uh, like, is the sun always giving off the same amount of neutrinos <laughs> in the same time? Yeah. Yeah, it's because it, it's based off of um, the nuclear fusion for the sun. It's a byproduct of uh, the process that fuses hydrogen and neutrinos. And so it, the flux of uh, neutrinos from the sun is the same, you know, at all points in time. Any other questions? Well, if anyone has more, uh, feel free to come up front if you're happy to stick around for a bit to answer okay. more questions. But otherwise, let's thank Barbara.